Um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let me pray, and then we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you know your Bible, if you know where we're going here this morning, you're going to go, what is he going to say about 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9? Last week was a little difficult to get through. What are we going to say about this one? Lord God, thank you for your word. Have your way. Amen. Let me read it to you, and uh, then we'll, we'll unpack the Father's heart from this foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over gives authority the wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority of over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to a refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Everybody say the word self-control. I say this as a concession. That is to say, this is not necessarily like a command of the Lord. He says, this is... This is a concession, not a command. This is not necessarily from the Lord, he's saying, but it's from me. Like, this is my thoughts and wisdom on the matter. But I wish everyone were single, just as I am, yet each person has their special gift from God of one kind or the other. So I say to those who aren't married and, and to widows, it is better to stay unmarried, just as I am, but if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. Wow, this is an amazing scripture to follow last week's Sunday. If you haven't seen that sermon, it is online, and uh, it's on our YouTube channel. I haven't quite, I haven't done the work to put it on our website yet, but it is there on the YouTube channel. Um, if you Google Yorkton Family Worship Center, you can, it'll come up for sure. In the context of marriage, Paul brings into full view the ninth fruit of the Spirit recorded for us in Galatians chapter 5, which is self-control. The very concept of self-control implies a battle between a divided self. It implies that our self produces desires that should not be satisfied, but instead be controlled. All of us struggle with overcoming sinful impulses. James says each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. James chapter 1 verse 14. But part of the human condition is to feel impulses. The part of the Christian life is to control them. Life and the world we live in, in it, it just propagates impulses. But the Christian life that we are called to live and have been welcomed into and have embraced by calling Jesus our Savior and our Lord implores us. It, it, I don't know if, it, ah, every time I say this, somebody looks at me funny, but behooves us. Like it just absolutely, like we have to comply because Jesus is Lord of our lives. So we have to control our impulses. Impulse control has been a struggle since the fall. Eve saw the fruit as desirable in Genesis chapter 3. And what'd she do? She followed that impulse and she ate it. Today we still struggle. Often the impulses seem so strong as to overpower our commitments and our common sense. We feel that giving in is our only option. 
And as I said last week, we always have a choice. In the book of Judges, we have this amazing historical account of one of the, one of the judges of Israel named Samson. Samson had quite a bit of trouble with impulse control. He is the perfect illustration of the proverb, which reads in, in Proverbs 25, verse 28, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Samson saw a Philistine woman he wanted to marry, and he married her despite his parents' objections. Judges 14, verses 1 through 2, and the marriage lasted a week. He found honey in the carcass of a dead animal. He ate it, even though in the process he had to break a vow, which was to not touch a carcass of a dead animal, and ceremonially defile himself. He couldn't say no to his urge for the honey. Judges 14, 8 through 9. And of course, we have the relational dynamics of his, his being pulled into um, never saying no to Delilah in Judges 16. Ironically, Samson is the best known, is best known for his physical strength. It goes to prove that our physical flesh is no ally. Listen to me. This is really important. It, go, it proves to show that our physical flesh is no ally to the battle against the fleshly sinful desires and wants that we have. It is a spiritual battle and must be won spiritually. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is, is gone, the new has come. As believers, we are new. We are no longer bound to our sinful natures. Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18 says, Thank God, once we were slaves to sin, but now we are wholeheartedly, we wholehearted, but now you wholeheartedly obey his teachings. We, we have given you. Now you are free from your, sin, from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. And all this newness is realized in the fullness of not just our position in Christ, but also in our daily living for Christ. through the process of sanctification. The coming of the new usually takes time and discipline. Even mature believers like Paul in Romans chapter 7, he very vulnerably shows and tells us that even him, the Apostle Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament, struggles and has to battle the flesh. He very vulnerably says in Romans chapter 7 through 18 and 18 through 25, I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I, in, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. The power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Now, we know we're not a slave, to, but we, can we just say that we acknowledge that there is a battle within us? And even as we talk about such realities... As our inner lives are laid bare through the vulnerability of Paul in this passage, just as we read, because we might find ourselves going, oh, that, sound, that feels like me. The Bible does provide ample hope that we can overcome our sinful desires and live self-controlled lives. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, I already mentioned it, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is a gift of God that is given to us through the Holy Spirit as he resides within us. He begins to bear fruit in us, and he is, we are given self-control. He produces self-control in us as we are yielded to him. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we have been given self-discipline. I think it's the New King James Version that says a sound mind. A lot of other translations will, dis, will, 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 will use self-discipline in that place. It relatively has the same heartbeat and theme of control, self-control. As the Spirit of God resides within us, we then have the ability with, within us, the ability through Holy Spirit to win over our struggle with sinful desires and live in self-control. I want to talk you through, and I have four on my list, but I feel like the Lord is highlighting two. Four things I have on my papers, on my list, in my notes, but I feel like the Lord is highlighting two. So I think we'll just go there. I'm going to tell you that I'll tell you the titles of the, all four, but I think we're going to unpack just two of them. I think. The first one is our love for God. And the second one is the truth of the word of God. And the third is fear of God. And the connection, and, and number four is connection and relationship. Yeah, I'm going to skip. Meet me for coffee someday if you want. Give me a call and I can talk you through how our love for God and the truth of the word of God greatly impacts the significance of, of, of sin's activity in our lives. I want to go to fear, the fear of God, the fear of God, the fear of God. For the believer, the fear of God is something much different than fear and trembling that causes us to run in the opposite direction. It's not a flight, it's not a fight or flight scenario where we flight or we run from whatever is going to cause us harm. The fear of God is something that it, 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 it propels us forward to the Lord. Because we don't want to break relational connection with our God. For the believer who is walking with Jesus, that can have the moment where we, 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 we engage in some sinful activity, we know that our... Now... I qualified this. I said, for the believer who's following Jesus but has a struggle, I'll say a struggle on the side, we know that positionally we are in Christ and we are saved. But we can understand as well that our fellowship with the Lord can really wane. We're not living in the intimacy. We're not living in the power. We're not living in, 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 in this beautiful connection with the Lord because we've got this thing, this festering sore of sin over here. The fear of God implores us to deal with that, to repent quickly and, and, and get back into sweet communion with God. We don't want to stay there any longer than we need to. We, in fact, we don't need to stay there at all. But, you know, we don't want to be there any longer than we have to. So we repent quickly. We get on our knees. We apply the grace, the blood of Jesus to that situation. And we turn from that sin. We turn from it. And we turn to Christ. And we run into his lap. And we put our head to his chest. And we hear the heart of God that beats for us. And we... We come back into sweet communion with God. We, we, we engage the communion of God, with God that we are called to live in. Church family, 
as I've been reading through my Bible, I've been reading through uh, Exodus, I'm into Leviticus, and there's a couple things that are really significant. Around the moment of the Ten Commandments, we have Mount Sinai. The Israelites are camped uh, beneath Mount Sinai, and, and God says, I'm going to come to the mountain, and Moses, I want you to come up on it, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up with smoke. I, I, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to descend. You're going to see me physically descend on the mountain. And I, it, I'm holy. And because I'm there, that space is holy. And so anything unclean, anything, and in fact, I only want you, Moses, to go come up on the mountain. I believe Aaron actually went with him too. Moses and Aaron went up on the mountain and received the Ten Commandments. First time, right? Yeah. And then the second time, it was just Moses because Aaron, he was being dumb and making a calf. Right? Yeah. Making an idol. The moment, the thing that I'm, I'm focusing on here, though, is the holiness of God. As he descended on the mountain, he said to the people, he said, don't let, don't come. Only Moses and Aaron, only Moses and Aaron can come. But the people of Israel, you cannot, and any animal that comes on the mountain. In fact, if you come on the mountain, you're going to die. Because I'm so holy. As you read through Leviticus, you see all of the, um, the, the sacrifices that the, that the old, in the Old Testament. Now, I know that Christ, he, he, um, he nullified all of that by his gift of his sacrifice on the cross. He fulfilled all of those, and so we don't have to do this anymore. But there is something as you read through. Don't neglect reading through the Old Testament. Don't neglect reading through Leviticus and Exodus and, and Numbers, these difficult books of the Bible that are actually quite hard because they're kind of cumbersome. They're, they're, you kind of have to lumber your way through it. But as you read through all of the way that the priests had to... Um, administer the sacrifices on behalf of the people of Israel for the sake of their sins and to bring purification to them, um, you can see that, wow, God is so holy. He's so holy. He's so holy. I think we cannot let ourselves get Numb to the fact that God is holy. We can't let ourselves become numb to the fact that he is almighty God. In him we have every breath. In him we have every need met. In him, uh, the history of the world was written by his hand. You know, I, and I quote this to you many times, but in the scriptures, in the Psalms, it says that he holds the, all of the water of the earth in the palm of his hand. His fingers span the universe. He knows every star by name. He put them in, this, in, the, in the expanse of the sky by name. He, he knows them all. He counts them all. He knows them all. Abraham couldn't count them, but God can. You know your story in Genesis where he says, come on, Abraham, come out of the tent and count them. Well, he couldn't. But God can. And, and he says to Abraham, because I'm God and you're not. We need to. We need to have this reverence, this awe, this fear of God that propels us into righteous living. I heard a, a, a pastor, I think it was a pastor or someone told a story recently to me. I, I listened to a lot of sermons and I listen to a lot of things online that, and, and I think this guy was telling us I don't do I don't do anything to harm my wife I don't do any I don't I make my choices in in regards to his marriage relationship I don't do certain things that I don't want to hurt her because I love her in the same way because of our relationship to Christ our relationship to God through Christ, in the same way, we don't want to do certain things because we don't want to be separated from God by the means of our fleshly sin. And so in the same way, we need to 
or in, in this whole context, we need to have this, like, God, you hold every, every one of my breaths in your hand. Every one of my breaths. You're God. You have numbered my days. I just think we need to have a little bit of tension there with that because it just, it, I don't want. I, I don't want, number one, I don't want to be distant from God. But I also don't want to come under his discipline either. Right? We look at the Old Testament and as we read it through, we go, wow, God really disciplines the people of Israel time and time again. They make this mistake. He disciplines them. He makes it. You know what? He's the same God as he was in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. And it says in the New Testament that God disciplines those he loves. So I think this should be a major motivational factor for us when we are faced with, should I do this or should I do that? Should I do this thing that doesn't honor the Lord or should I do this thing that honors the Lord? Well, let's choose the one that honors the Lord because God is God and he is holy. And he's watching. There's that old song, God is watching us from a distance. No, he's not He's watching us from right here, right here, and going, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to honor me? Or are you? And, 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 and church, you've heard me preach a lot about grace. But this isn't the moment where I'm teaching about grace. This is the moment, and, and as I've unpacked this sermon, as i prepared this sermon, I've got a lot more notes that I just skipped over, like two pages worth of notes out of the five, and because the Lord is highlighting this since before the sermon, he's like, I just want you to go here, just go here, just go here, just go here. So we're just going to go there, and it feels like, well, this feels very one-sided. Yeah, well, it's very pointed because the Lord wants to get something across. I'm watching. I'm with you. What are you going to choose? What are you going to do? With this opportunity to exercise your flesh, are you going to do it? Are you going to are you going to choose to act on your impulse that is by its very nature sinful? What are you going to choose? I am watching, and I am God. Like, this should dramatically shift and change the way that we choose to live moment by moment by moment by moment. God, you're, what? God, you're with me. Okay, I'm going to choose this. I'm going to choose this. I'm going to honor the Lord, honor the Lord, honor the Lord. Like, how much, how, like, just think about this. I'll just, you go back into marriage. This context is marriage. And so, um, husbands. You, you would choose to do certain things when your wife's in the room. Wives, you would choose to do certain things when your husband's in the room because you're going to honor each other, right? Because they're in the room watching. Well, just consider the fact that God's in the room watching. Wow. <gasps> okay. Now, I thank the Lord for his grace. I thank the Lord for his mercies that are new every morning. Come on, we've already preached about that. Sang about that. But there's something to be grasped here about the holiness of God and the presence of God in our lives that shifts and changes the way we live because he is holy and because we do not wish to depart from his presence. So we need to have a holy fear of God when it comes to our Sinful impulses. The fourth one on my list, and, and the, the second one that I'm going to present to you this, this morning is connection and relationship. I am... Um, I'm going through a course for men called Brave Co. Brave Co. It's like all one word. B-R-A-V-E-C-O. Brave Co. And... 
it's with the intention that I might present it to our church as a, um, a men's course. It's like 13 weeks or something like that. And um, I said to our board, I said, I want to do this first. I want to do it first. I want to go through it. I want to experience it before we engage it and present it to our men. And so I, I went through, uh, I, I, was print, I was painting in Pastor Mel's office um, this last week, and I had it going. I listened to this one two and a half times because my family joined in, or they, they, they surprised me <laughs> and uh, came into the building, and I turned, turned it off. So I got about two and a half, one and a half times through um, this, this lesson. And this, in this lesson, the, the, the presenter, Jason Valentin, he was talking about how relationship is a significant factor for us overcoming fleshful, fleshy, sinful impulses and desires. Relationship is so, so important. He tells a story how in, 19, in the 1970s, there was this doctor, his name was, I, I got to wrote it down here, Bruce Alexander. Dr. Bruce Alexander, he... He did this rat park, he called the rat park experiment. The rat park experiment. Has anybody heard about this? The rat park experiment. The first part of the experiment he did not do. He did this in, in response to other studies where they would take single rats and they would put them in a cage and they would have drug-laced water in one container and they would have clean water in uh, in 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 another container, and the rat had nothing but the water, the, the drug-laced water and the clean water to occupy himself with. He was in a cage. And undoubtedly and inevitably, the mouse got hooked on the drugs in the water, and he just drank himself to death. Now, in response to that, Dr. Alexandra, Alexander, he, he said, well, what, what if we change the environment? So he took uh, this experiment a little further and he created what he called the rat park experiment. He created cages with multiple rats in them with, um, with uh, little structures for pr like, like rat wheels and things for them to play on and stuff. And then he put the drug-laced water in there and he put the pure water in there. And none of them overdosed and died. Why? His conclusion was relationship. That's in short. That's the short, that's my short answer to that. Relationship. What does the devil do when we find ourselves in addiction to or in, in a habitual sin? That's a nice way to put it. It's like kind of the, the way we as Christians like to talk about addiction. But we, when we're in an addiction, um, what is the one thing that happens? Ultimately, what happens is we get singled out. We, get, we, we, we isolate ourselves because we are hiding our sin. We are hiding our, our fleshly acts that are contrary to the Lord. And we, we, we stop going to church. We stop hanging out with our friends. We stop making phone calls. We stop connecting with people. And I've told you this time and time again. When the devil gets us alone, he begins to win. I want to remind you that Paul had Timothy and David had Jonathan and Barnabas had John Mark and the disciples, they went out two by two. Ruth had Naomi and Esther had Mordecai and Moses had Aaron and Joshua had Caleb and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. <laughs> Relationship is key. If you want to overcome whatever this, this fleshy thing that you've been battling for years, then you need to drag it into the light with some other person. The scripture says in James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your sins one to another, and you'll be what? Healed. That's relationship. That's relationship, church. That's accountability. It, it's, it's, as one person said recently, um, going belly button to belly button with somebody. Like, you, don't, you can't hide nothing when you're belly button to belly button. That was his wording. And you just talk it out. 
You air it out. Belly button to belly button. And I've said it to you that you can talk about and you can say anything to anyone when you have your arm around them. Relationship, relationship, relationship is so important. Good relationship, godly relationship. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34 says, Bad company corrupts good character. And this is where we have Hebrews chapter 10 that tells us, starting in verse 24, not just 25, we often just quote 25, but 24 as well. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Wow. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In our passage of scripture that we read and that we used as a launching pad and as a foundation for what I'm sharing with you this morning, we have the marital uh, picture of intimacy. I I won't go too far into that, but I will say this. This is all about relationship. It's all about relationship. And if relationship is present in your life, if you've got connection with someone, if if you're married, then as a husband, you have your connection with your wife. If you're a wife, then you have a connection with your husband but if if but beyond that relationship is for everyone we are not meant to do this life alone and so foster and grow and cultivate friends you guys cultivate friends i know it's really hard for some of us it's like when asked who's your best friend you kind of draw a blank That's a really sad thing. And I would pray that you can. You can find that person that you can talk to, confide in, do life together with. Relationship is key, church. If you want to break free from a lot of sin addictions, especially, relationship will be your door. Of freedom. You'll try this 12 step program, you'll, st- you'll try this, you'll try this, you'll try. If you're doing it alone, then you're gonna do it wrong. And you're not gonna have the benefit of another person going belly button to belly button with you, putting his arm around you, loving on you when you need it, giving you a hug. It's the value of touch, it's the value of words, it's the value of. of Looking somebody in the eye. And God says, stop isolating yourself. Find your friend. Find your people. Find your person. Find your tribe is a word we like to use around here. Find your tribe and stick with them. Go shoulder to shoulder. Go belly to button to belly button and sort this out. We... we like the wording accountability partner, that's something that was coined back in the early 2000s, I think. That was really big back then. If that's the wording you like, that's, that's what I'm presenting to you. I'm account- like accountability partner. But I, I'm, it's not just about accountability. It's about relationship because so much accountability partner, I've done that before for a lot of people. And it, it just gets kind of sterile. Like it's just like come and give me your report, <laughs> and how'd you do, and this and that. But that's not what I'm presenting to you. I'm like, do life together, church. Break bread with one another. Break bread with one another. Relationship is key if you're going to overcome your fleshly desires. And Paul talks about that with regards, if you're going to burn with lust, well, get married Relationship is key. That's what I'm going to get. That's what I'm going to present to you from those passages of scripture. And there's a lot more in there. If you want to have coffee, we can talk about verses one through six if you'd like. We'll make it a marriage counseling type situation. Bring your wife along, and I'll bring my wife along, and we'll talk about it. But my goodness, if you want to grab something really good from that, those verses today that applies to what the Lord is revealing to us. Relationship is key when conquering the flesh. Samson couldn't do it in all of his might, but relationship is key when conquering your flesh. 
when you're shoulder to shoulder, belly button to belly button with somebody, you act different. And in that moment, the Lord uses people as a part of his instrument to extend grace to us and to train us. Because we do. We act differently when other people see us, when other people are around, when other eyes are watching, right? It's just natural. It's not that we're being fake, but we make different choices. Undoubtedly, we make, if we're keeping good company, we make better choices, right? Godly choices. So choose your friends well. There's a lot of good people right around you right now. I don't recommend that you go over, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm now your best friend. I don't recommend that. But I do recommend, go for Dairy Queen. See what God does. I want to read to you Proverbs chapter 3, and then we'll close. Really, and I was wondering, has God revealed anything for you with regards to any extra ministry that might happen before I close our word this morning? Raylene and Brian are available for prayer this morning. They'll be at the front for you, for you to receive any extra ministry. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 through 8 says, it, says this. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that which the Lord has revealed to us today, may he impart it deeper upon your hearts. Church, I said a lot of things. But hear this. God is holy and he wants you to have a friend. Have you struggled with some stuff? Have you struggled with some sin? God is holy, and he wants you to have a friend. So I want you to pursue relationship with one another. Pursue it. Pursue it. I can't make you all be friends. And I'm not willing to do that either. But I, I want to encourage you. Do what you can to find your people, find your tribe, and walk life together. Godly, co godly company. Godly company. It'll change everything. It'll change everything. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I thank you that you have designed us to walk in relationship. You've designed us to acknowledge your holiness. Lord God, I pray that we would be very aware of your presence. As you build into us character, as you build into us holiness, as you refine us through fire, I pray, Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that we would, I pray, Lord God, that each one would, would have a good friend. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would foster relationships. Uh, I pray, Lord God, against any scheme of the enemy that has segregated or separated people in this body. And in Jesus' name, devil, you cannot break relationships in this house. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
I pray, Lord God, that we would be a people, we'd be a group of people that walk shoulder to shoulder, belly button to belly button with each other. We would look each other square in the eye and we would do life together, encouraging one another in righteous living for your namesake, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name, amen. Amen. So, I know that we're going out to a restaurant this afternoon um, with a friend named John, and so we're quite excited about that. Uh, let's all flood the restaurants and let's go out for lunch with each other and uh, have a good time. Let's build relationship, church. You all are wonderful people, and uh, I just want to encourage you. God is holy, and find a friend, and he will help you in all of that you will have the freedom you need to break free. You'll break free from that issue of sin in your life. Those are two building blocks, two points um, that I think are, well, you gotta, you got to incorporate them into your plan, into your playbook when you're overcoming your sin. Bless you, church. Have a great day. There's more things to talk about regarding that, but we'll get to that another day. Bless you, church. Let's all be friends. And let's all eat together. Bless you. Have a good day.